Hi, everybody. I hope everybody had a good weekend as always. The year has gone by ridiculously fast, guys. Um, and this will be our ninth week of virtual learning. I miss you all dearly. Um, but we're getting through this together. And I don't know about you, but for me, the weeks are getting a little bit easier as far as the work that I have to do, right? I already have a hang of the online learning. Okay, um, so this week, we're going to focus on fantasy. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. All right, guys, so what is fantasy? Remember, we have already gone over fantasy, so this would just be a review, okay? So what is fantasy? Fantasy is an imaginative story that is entirely made up, okay? Fantasy stories have events that could not occur in real life. So fantasy stories are just, it's just a complete made-up story. It can never, ever, ever happen in our lifetime. These, these stories will kind of be um, like your Disney movies or maybe some of the books that you guys read. Um, those will be fantasy. So I know that those Dogman books, those are fantasy. Uh, Cinderella is fantasy. The Little Mermaid is fantasy. Uh, what is it called? Onward? That movie Onward, that movie is also a complete fantasy. So anything of that sort that is um, made up or seems out of this world, like it could never happen, that is fantasy. So how do you know when something is fantasy? Well, it has unrealistic characters. So in that movie Onward, I'm gonna go ahead and use that movie as right now. Um, that movie Onward has um, a centaur, or, or no, centaurs, right? The half man, half horse. Um, they have goblins, they have magic, they have fairies. So this could mean animals are able to talk or the characters have magical powers. Um, in Cinderella, she has her uh, fairy godmother, who is a fairy who has magic, who magically transform her, transforms her and other animals into things that aren't, you know, that we couldn't do in our daily lives. I wish I could just wave my magic wand and my dishes would be cleaned, right? Or I would be ready in the morning or I could poof myself to work unrealistic events happen right so for example magic carpet riots as in aladdin or traveling through time just things like i said that are out of this world right why do fat why do writers write fantasy okay you have your author's purpose which is persuade inform entertain now authors write these stories since they're out of this world since they have magic since they're just fun they are to entertain your reader right they can be creative and they can come up with a silly or crazy story that will keep the reader engaged in reading. That's all these books are for, right? These are the books that you guys are most interested in because these are the ones that are gonna keep you wanting to read. They're gonna keep you on the edge of your seat because you wanna read stuff that you know couldn't happen, right? We, we live our everyday lives, we experience these things. It's kind of fun to read about uh, things that couldn't happen, right? Or imagine that these things could. So some examples of fantasy are going to be the Chronicles of Narnia. Okay, they go into the wardrobe, right? We don't magically go into the wardrobe or we don't magically go into our closets and end up in a magical world. Lions don't talk, animals don't talk. Harry Potter, magic, right? They live in the magic world. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is also fantasy. And Inkheart, for those of you who have not read Inkheart, Incred is actually a really, really good book. It's a little bit long, um, but hopefully when you guys are going into middle school, that will be something or a book that you guys put on your radar or on your list of things to read, right? Now, with fantasy, uh, they will have, or the, the author will include a lot of figurative language. Now, when we talk about figurative, figurative language, we take it all the way back to when we were talking about poetry, that first week of our virtual lessons. We are talking about poetry. Now in poetry, they have a lot of figurative language. In these fantasy stories, you will also find a lot of figurative language. Now remember, figurative language is what's gonna add color, 
what's going to add some glitter, what's going to add some pop to that story, right? To make it a little bit more easier to read, right? So figurative language will be your simile, your metaphor, your alliteration, all of that good stuff. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share with you again. Starting off with, of course, we all know this one, simile, right? So a simile is something that uses like or as to make a comparison. Authors use simile to make their writing more descriptive or vivid, so like I said, colorful. So instead of writing, Meg and I are best friends. It's pretty simple. The author could use a simile, Meg and I are like two peas in a pod. Remember that word like will make it a simile. Like two peas in a pod. Now, if you guys haven't seen two peas in a pod, it's literally a pod, the green little, it looks like a little leaf. And then two, there's, there's little, um, peas and that's where the peas are but they have to peel the pot open and you'll find the peas now she is comparing her friendship to to meg meg is comparing the friendship to oh yes no she's comparing her friendship to meg to being like two peas in a pot right they 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 are inseparable so two peas in a pot are close together the author and meg are close friends this simply helps the reader understand their friendship so instead of writing I was so happy to pass my test, use the simile. Passing my test was like winning the lottery. When you win the lottery, you have this amazing feeling. I've never won the lottery, so I wouldn't know firsthand how it feels, unfortunately. But I can just imagine, you know, you win the lottery, you win all this money, you don't know what to do with it, you're excited, you have all these emotions, right? So when you pass a test, maybe your test was really, really hard, or maybe you studied a lot. And so when you finally pass your test, you get this sign of relief, you feel really anxious, you feel really excited. You have all these motions going to you as well. Um, instead of writing Max ran fast, you could use a simile Max was as fast as a flash of lightning. So you could either use like or as. In this case, we would use it as. So Max was as fast as a flash of lightning. A flash of lightning, sometimes it's so hard for us to see because it just goes quick, right? It's in and out. After the lightning, we hear the thunder, but the actual flash of lightning is quick. So they're comparing that this guy, Max, is as fast as that, right? My teacher is sweet, okay? My teacher is sweet, is as sweet as pie, right? Pie is sweet, um, depending on what kind you eat, right? Most of the pie is sweet. So they're comparing the sweetness of the teacher to that of a pie, right? It just adds a little bit more vividness to the, to the sentence, to your story. And it maybe it helps us imagine what the author is trying to say a little bit better, right? Then we have metaphor. Metaphor is kind of like simile, where you are comparing two things, but you are not using like or as. You are directly saying that one thing is the other. That's how you're comparing the two, right? So strong metaphors will suggest that two different things are similar. So instead of writing, writing my room is a mess, the author could use the metaphor, my room is a pigsty, okay? So the author has a messy room and a pigsty is a messy place. The author doesn't really live in an actual pigsty, but the comparison helps the reader understand how messy the room is. So a pigsty is basically a pen where all the pigs are held, right? You got mud, you got poop, you got uh, food, you got this, you got that. It's, it's dirty in there, right? So she doesn't literally live in a pigsty. They're just comparing of how it might look, right? In other words, her, her room might be trashed. She might have stuff all over the place. She might have clothes, trash, food, whatever it might be, right? So for metaphors, you're comparing one thing directly to the other. So instead of writing, my classmates can be crazy sometimes, you would write, my classmates are a bunch of wild animals. Wild animals don't have structure. Wild animals don't have rules. So saying that your classmates are like wild animals, meaning that they're kind of running all over the place. They don't have, they're not following the rules. They don't have a structure. Sally is a sweet girl. Sally is a little angel. Angels are sweet. Angels are the, uh, you know, angels don't, can never do any wrong. So they're comparing Sally to an angel. In other words, she doesn't do anything wrong. She's the perfect little girl. You're in trouble. You're toast right? I don't know why they compare toast uh, to being in trouble, but that's the same, 
right? When you want to say you're in trouble, you're toast, right? Meaning you're, you're done for. She had beautiful blonde hair. She had locks of gold. Does that mean she literally had locks of gold? Just means that her hair was so luscious, it was the color of what gold might look like, right? Because it was blonde. So similarly, in metaphor are comparing two different things. Simile is using like or as. Metaphor is just directly comparing one thing to the other, right? Idiom, okay? An idiom is a common expression that can't be taken literally, but the meaning is understood. So instead of I tell you, hey guys, good luck, I'm gonna tell you, break a leg. I don't literally want you to break your leg. That is just a sign of good luck. That's what people say when they wanna say good luck, right? So let me give you an example. It is raining really hard, it's raining cats and dogs. In other words, um, cats and dogs fight like crazy. So outside, it is probably crazy. The wind is going and the rain is coming down hard. It just means that I, I can picture, right, what, what's happening. Um, I am really mad. You could say my blood is boiling, right? In other words, my blood is boiling. That, that's what people say when they, when they want to say, you know, my, se me puso la cara roja, like how mad I got. My blood rushed. In other words, I, I got so upset that my blood was literally boiling. It was, it was, I, was, I felt so hot. I was so mad. Hyperbole is an exaggeration. So instead of writing, I'm impatient for my birthday, you could write, my birthday will never get here. It is going to get there eventually, but you're kind of exaggerating. You're, you're, you're expressing how anxious you are for it to happen, right? You, you can't wait for it to get here, so it feels like it's never going to get here. Um, I'm so hungry. An exaggeration would be, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. I'm not literally going to go and eat a horse. First of all, that's gross and inhumane and poor horsey. But I'm just saying that the horse is big and that's how much that I could probably eat right now. Personification has that word person in it. You are given human qualities to a non-human thing, right? Something that is not living is being given human-like qualities. So instead of writing the leaves were blowing, you could say the leaves were dancing in the wind. Personally, that's my favorite personification, the leaves dancing in the wind, because that's literally what they look like, right? It looks like they're dancing in the wind. So they weren't really dancing because leaves can't dance, leaves don't have legs, but that's how they look like when they're blowing with the wind. Um, so some examples would be, the thunder was so loud. The thunder clapped angrily. The thunder didn't literally clap, that's just the sound that it made, right? And it didn't angrily because it was so loud and intense. Onomatopoeia, sizzle, spat, zip, crackle, crunch, bang, zing, ding, whoosh, achoo, glug, fizz, slurp, boom, clang. It's the actual sound word, right? When you read it, that's the sound that it makes. So again, it just adds um, fun to the story, right? It makes the story fun. It makes it, oh, you know, it, it, it just adds to the story. It gives that color again. Alliteration. Alliteration is the repetition of a beginning sound in two or more nearby words. Authors add alliteration to entertain the reader and draw attention to a phrase or sentence. So if I want you to really, really focus on this one sentence or on this one phrase, I'm gonna probably add alliteration so that your mind or your, or when you're, as you're reading it, your mind kind of internalizes, oh my God, the BBB sound or the CCC sound. So for example, Silly Susie sings songs while she strolls in the store. S, 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 okay. Betty baked brownies for, the, for her best friend. So these are kind of like the trabalenguas, like your tongue twisters. Mrs. Miller makes melodies during music. The rain roared right outside my window. The generous gentleman just paid my entire bill. So adding alliteration is like a tongue twister um, to your writing. Assonance, assonance is a repetition of the vowel sounds in two or more nearby words. So alliteration is the repetition of the beginning sound. Assonance is the repetition of the vowel sounds. Authors add assonance again to entertain their readers and draw attention to a phrase or sentence. The rain in Spain stays mainly in the plains. A-I, 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 or A, right? They ignite the fire at night. I, the sad cat sat on the drab mat and grabbed at the rat. A, the slow toad goes over the road to get away from the lawnmower. Oh, it's probably O. The cook looked in the book before he shook the salt shaker. Oh, right? It's just wordplay, basically, what it is. 
and it'll add to the story. It'll add to whatever you're reading and it'll make it a little more playful. A pun. A pun is a play on words and sounds very similar to a joke. Puns are meant to be humorous, they're meant to be funny, and to make readers laugh. So it's a joke. Mark was shopping for a camouflage shirt, but he was having a hard time finding one. So this, for those of you who don't know, camouflage is what they use to kind of obviously blend into their surroundings. So if he was looking for a camouflage, a camouflage shirt, he couldn't find one because it was camouflage, right? So that's supposed to be funny. Another example would be, Michael was assigned to write a report about his dream job. He had a hard time deciding what he wanted to be when he grew up, so he simply wrote, sleeping is my dream job. After winning the 100, 100 millimeter, no, after winning the 100 meter hurdle race, a reporter interviewed Crystal about her success. Crystal smiled and said, I used to have a fear of running hurdles, but I quickly got over it. So hurdles is when you have, I guess it kind of looks like it's a little, it's an obstacle that you have to jump. And when they're running, the runners will jump over these hurdles. So she had a fear of doing it, but then she quickly got over it. Get it? Because she goes over them. So these are basically supposed to be jokes. It, it, it's just funny. Okay. A cliche. A cliche is a phrase or expression that is overly used and very well known. They can lack originality and creativity, and oftentimes authors aren't even aware they're using them. It is just something that we probably say all the time and that we hear all the time, and so authors will include it because it's just normal, right? Again, they probably don't even know what they're using it. They probably don't want to be using it, but it just goes with what the story, what's happening in the story. So you've probably heard many times, we're not laughing at you, we're laughing with you. Or only time will tell. Uh, they lived happily ever after, right? Imagery. Imagery is a big one. Imagery is when the author will add colorful language to kind of help us create that image or that movie in our minds, right? The full moon was a bright yellow disc shining in the dark of night. The soft white sand warmed my feet as I strolled home after a day on the beach. There are things that we can actually feel with our senses, right? Our five senses. So that is figurative language, guys. And you will find that again in a lot of your fiction stories. But today we're talking about fantasy, so we're going to read a story. I'm going to go ahead and read you um, an excerpt from Harry Potter, from a Harry Potter story. And all we're going to do today is we're going to go ahead and highlight um, the figurative language that we find in that. And we're also going to talk about the elements of, of fantasy. Why is this excerpt, or why is that part fantasy? Uh, you know, what makes it? What are the elements of it that make it fantasy? Okay, before I do that though, I did want to talk to you guys about theme. Now, I noticed that one of the things that you guys were kind of messing up on, and I think almost maybe only two or three people got it, last week for your drama uh, quiz, the very last question was one that you had to type in, and it was basically just, what is theme? Or no, it was, it was just a, a question, right? What is theme? And I want to say at least 90% of you guys put theme as main idea. That is completely wrong, guys. I want to clear the air right now. That is completely wrong. Theme is not main idea, okay? Theme is the lesson or the moral that the story is trying to teach you, that you that the lesson that you get from the story, that the author is trying to, to get you to, to, to learn, right? So in Pinocchio, Every time he lies, his nose grows. So the theme of that story would be never to lie, right? And let's see which other one. And the tortoise and the hare, okay? The tortoise was very slow, obviously, and the hare was very fast. So as the tortoise was going slowly, right, trying to go at his own pace, he would finish at his own pace, the hare was kind of slacking off because he knew he would finish faster. Well, at the end, he slacked off too much and the turtle won anyway. So the theme for that, the lesson for that that you learned would be slow and steady wins the race. In other words, don't rush through your stuff, take your time, take it easy, you'll probably do a much better job. So that is what theme is, guys, the moral or lesson of the story. It is not main idea. I need you guys to really understand that because for some reason, you have been having a hard time for that. 
okay? Theme is the moral or the lesson. What did you learn? What did you get from that story? How can you apply it to your real life, right? So I just want to give you that piece just because I, I, I did realize that we were missing on that and I really wanted to touch base on that, okay? So let's go ahead and I'm going to go and read you The Worst Birthday from Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. So this is a sixth grade text, but it's a 980 level. So you guys will be there next year, right? You guys should already be getting there for next year. So uh, this is from J.K. Rowling. She is a British novelist, a screenwriter, and a film producer best known for creating the Harry Potter series, okay? The title character, Harry Potter, is an orphan who attends a boarding school trying about magic. On his summer vacation, he is forced to live with his non-magical extended family. For those of you who have read Harry Potter, you will kind of find this piece a little bit um, familiar. For those of you who haven't and who don't know about Harry Potter, again, Harry Potter is that um, he is a boy who goes to magic school and he has magic, right? He comes from he comes from a family of magic, but during his vacations times, because his parents did pass away, he does stay with his family who is not magical. And so there are some issues there. So we're going to go ahead and read The Worst Birthday. And we're gonna, again, we're going to highlight. We're going to highlight the figurative language that we find here. And as I'm going, I'll go ahead and stop. And I will really pinpoint those elements of fantasy, right? What makes this fantasy? Not for the first time, an argument had broken out over breakfast at number four, private Privet Drive. Mr. Vernon Dursley had been woken in the early hours of the morning by a loud hooting noise from his nephew, from his nephew Harry's room. Third time this week, he roared across the table. If you can't control that owl, it'll have to go. Harry tried yet again to explain. She's bored, he said. She's used to flying around outside. If I could just let her out at night, do I look stupid? snarled Uncle Vernon, a bit of fried egg dangling from his bushy mustache. I know what'll happen if the owls let out. He exchanged dark looks with his wife, Petunia. He exchanged dark looks. Was it a literal dark look? No, it was probably like a glaring look, something that was kind of menacing. Harry tried to argue, but his words were drowned by a large belch from the Dursley's son, Dudley. So his words were drowned. Were his words literally drowned? No. It just wants to say that he couldn't get a word in, right? That the, the burp was so loud that they couldn't even hear what he had said. I want more bacon. There's more in the frying pan, sweetum, said Aunt Petunia, turning misty eyes on her massive son. We must build you up while we've got the chance. I don't like the sound of that school food. Nonsense, Petunia. I never went hungry when I was at Smoltings, said Uncle Vernon heartily. Dudley gets enough, don't you, son? Dudley, who was so large, his bottom drooped over either side of the kitchen chair, grinned and turned to Harry. Pass the frying pan. You've forgotten the magic word, said Harry irritably. The effect of this simple sentence on the rest of the family was so incredible. Dudley gasped and fell off his chair with a crash that shook the whole, ch the whole kitchen. Now, did it literally shake the whole kitchen? No, but they want us to uh, be able to picture how big he was, right? So he was so big when he fell, it felt like it shook the, ch the kitchen. Mrs. Dursley gave a small scream and slapped her hands to her mouth. Mouth. Mr. Dursley jumped to his feet, veins throbbing in his temples. Now, were they really throbbing? No, but you know, when some people are upset, right here it'll pop out, that just means that they're really, really mad. I meant please, said Harry quickly. I didn't mean. What have I told you? thundered his uncle. Thundered again, there means it was so loud the way he said it. Spraying spit over the table. 
about saying the M word in our house. But I, how dare you, Threaden Dudley, roared Uncle Vernon, pounding the table with his fist. I just, I warned you, I will not tolerate mention of your abnormality under this roof. Harry stared from his purple-faced uncle to his pale aunt, who was trying to heave Dudley to his feet. All right, said Harry, all right. Uncle Vernon sat back down, breathing like a winded rhinoceros. Right here, breathing like a winded rhinoceros. I have like, so this will be a simile. And watching Harry closely out of the corners of his small, sharp eyes. Ever since Harry had come home from the summer holidays, Uncle Vernon had been treating him like a bomb that might go off at any moment. Again, there's another simile, like. So he was comparing maybe Harry's behavior or Harry's temperament to that of a bomb. It'll just go off, you won't expect it because Harry Potter wasn't a normal boy. As a matter of fact, he was not normal as it is pot he was not normal as it is possible to be. Harry Potter was a wizard. That right there, guys, that is a fantasy part. Wizards don't exist. A wizard fresh from his first year at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft. Okay, this school is complete fantasy. And if the Dursleys were unhappy to have him back for the holidays, it was nothing to how Harry felt. He missed Hogwarts so much, it was like having a constant stomach ache. Okay, so right here, this is your hyperbole. This is the exaggeration of how it just wants to show you how much he missed it. It felt like his actual stomach hurt. He missed the castle with its secret passageways and ghosts. His classes, though perhaps not Snape, Snape, the potions master, the mail arriving by owl, eating banquets in the great hall, sleeping in his four-poster bed in the tower dormitory, visiting the gamekeeper Hagrid in his cabin next to the forbidden forest in the grounds, and especially Quidditch, the most popular sport in the wizarding world. Six tall goalposts, four flying balls, and 14 players on broomsticks. Again, we don't play on broomsticks, <laughs> so this is that fantasy portion. All Harry's spell books, his wand, robes, cauldron, and top of the nine in this 2000 broomstick had been locked in a cupboard under the stairs by Uncle Vernon the instant Harry had come home. What did the Dursleys care if Harry lost his place in the house footage team because he hadn't practiced all summer? What was it to the Dursleys if Harry went back to school without any of his homework done? The Dursleys were what wizards called muggles, not a drop of magic blood in their veins. And as far as they were concerned, having a wizard in the family was a matter of deepest shame. Uncle Vernon had even padlocked Harry's owl Hedwig inside her cage to stop her from carrying messages to anyone in the wizarding world. Harry looked nothing like the rest of the family. Uncle Vernon was large and necklace with an enormous black mustache. Aunt Petunia was horse-faced and bony. Dudley was blonde, pink, and porky. Harry, on the other hand, was small and skinny with brilliant green eyes and jet black hair that was always untidy. He wore round glasses and on his forehead was a thin lightning shaped scar. This whole paragraph right here, guys, is where the author is using imagery. Okay, right here we are getting a very, very vivid picture of what the family looks like. It was this scar that made Harry so particularly unusual even for a wizard. This scar was the only hint of Harry's very mysterious past, of the reason he had been left at the Dursley's doorstep 11 years before. At the age of one year old, Harry had somehow survived a curse from the greatest dark sorcerer of all time, Lord Voldemort, whose name most witches and wizards still feared to speak. Harry's parents had died in Voldemort's attack, but Harry had escaped with his lightning scar, and somehow, Nobody understood why Voldemort's powers had been destroyed the instant he had failed to kill Harry. So Harry had been brought up by his dead mother's sister and her husband. He had spent 10 years with the Dursleys, never understanding why he kept making odd things happen without meaning to, believing the Dursley story that he had gotten his scar in the car crash that had killed his parents. 
And then, exactly a year ago, Hogwarts had written to Harry, and the whole story had come out. Harry had taken up his place at a wizard school, where he and his scar were famous. But now that school year was over, but now the school year was over, and he was back with the Dursleys for the summer, back to be treated like a dog that had rolled in something smelly. So he's comparing the way he feels that he is treated to that of, of a dog, right? When, when a dog rolls and something's smelly, you don't want to touch, you don't want to be near it, go outside, right? That's how he felt. The Dursleys hadn't even remembered that today happened to be Harry's 12th birthday. Of course, his hopes hadn't been high. They'd never given him a real present, let alone a cake, but to ignore it completely? At that moment, Uncle Vernon cleared his throat importantly and said, now, as we all know, today is a very important day. Harry looked up, hardly daring to believe. This could be the day I make the biggest deal of my career, said Uncle Vernon. Harry went back to his toast. Of course, he thought bitterly. Uncle Vernon was talking about the stupid dinner party. He'd been talking of nothing else for two weeks. Some rich builder and his wife were coming to dinner and Uncle Vernon was hoping to get a huge order from him. Uncle Vernon's company made drills. I think we should run through the schedule one more time, said Uncle Vernon. We should, we should all be in position at eight o'clock. Petunia, you will be in the lounge, said Petunia properly, promptly, waiting to welcome them graciously to our home. Good, good, and Dudley, I'll be waiting to open the door. Dudley put on a foul, simpering smile. May I take your coats, Mr. and Mrs. Mason? They'll love them. They'll love him, cried Petunia rapturously. Excellent, Dudley, said Uncle Vernon. Then he rounded on Harry. And you? I'll be in my bedroom, making no noise and pretending I'm not there, said Harry tonelessly. Exactly, said Uncle Vernon nastily. I will lead them into the lounge, introduce you, Petunia, and pour them drinks. At 8.15, I'll announce dinner, said Aunt Petunia, and Dudley, you'll say, may I take you through to the dining room, Mrs. Mason, said Dudley, offering his fat arm to an invisible woman. My perfect little gentleman, sniffed Aunt Petunia, and you, said Uncle Vernon viciously to Harry. I'll be in my room, making no noise and pretending I'm not there, said Harry Dudley. Precisely. Now, we should aim to get in a few good compliments at dinner. Petunia, any ideas? Vernon tells me you're a wonderful gold for Mr. Mason. Do tell me where you bought your dress, Mrs. Mason. Perfect, Dudley. How about, we had to write an essay about our hero at school, Mrs. Mason, and I wrote about you. This was too much for Aunt Petunia and Harry. Aunt Petunia burst into tears and hugged her son while Harry ducked under the table so they wouldn't see him laughing. And you, boy, Harry fought to keep his face straight as he emerged. I'll be in my room, making no noise and pretending I'm not there, he said. Too right you will, said Uncle Vernon forcefully. The Masons don't know anything about you, and it's going to stay that way. When dinner's over, you may you take Mrs. Mason back to the lounge for coffee. Petunia and I will bring the subject around to drills. With any luck, I'll have the deal signed and sealed before the news at 10. We'll be shopping for a vacation home in Majorca this time tomorrow. Harry couldn't feel too excited about this. He didn't think the Dursleys would like him any better in Majorca than they did on Privet Drive. Right, I'm off into town to pick up the dinner jackets for Dudley and me. And you, he snarled at Harry, you stay out of your aunt's way while she's cleaning. Harry left through the back door, it was a brilliant sunny day. He crossed the lawn, slumped down on the garden bench, and sang under his breath. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. No cards, no presents. And he would be spending the evening pretending not to exist. He gazed miserably into the hedge. He had never felt so lonely. More than anything else at Hogwarts, even more even than playing Quidditch, Harry missed his best friend, Ron Weasley and Hermione Granger. They, however, didn't seem to be missing him at all. Neither of them had written to him all summer, even though Ron had said he was going to ask Harry to come and stay. Countless times, Harry had been on the point of unlocking Hedwig's cage by magic and sending her to Ron and Hermione with a letter. 
but it wasn't worth the risk. Underage wizards weren't allowed to use magic outside of school. Harry hadn't told the Dursleys this. He knew it would only tear it was their only terror that he might turn them in all into dung beetles and stop them from locking him in the cupboard under the stairs with his one broomstick. For the first couple of weeks, Harry had enjoyed muttering nonsense words under his breath and watching Dudley tearing out of his room as fast as his fat legs could carry him. But the long silence from Ron and Hermione had made Harry feel so cut off from the magical world that even taunting Dudley had lost its appeal. And now Ron and Hermione had forgotten his birthday. I'm gonna go ahead and stop there, guys. Uh, as always, I will go ahead and link this story to the rest of the videos in the notes so you can go ahead and read it when you're done watching the videos. Now, my point for reading this story was just because, remember, we're talking about fantasy, so I really, really wanted to highlight the fantasy part. Magic doesn't exist. This magical school doesn't exist witches, um, wizards, uh, broomsticks, flying on broomsticks, all of that does not exist in our world as much as I know some of us would really, really like it. But that is all that fantasy part, right? Owls, as I don't, I mean, I'm pretty sure that you could train them to, but I know that in our culture, we really don't mess with owls. Owls especially don't be, aren't delivering um, messages back and forth. And we don't get a magic letter in the mail saying that we're going to this magical school, right? So all of that is fantasy. The fiction part is where we have that figurative language, right? There is a lot of figurative language in this story. Again, all that figurative language does is it add color. It adds color to a story. It makes the story a little bit easier to read, a little bit funner to read. And it helps the reader definitely create that image in our minds because we get that imagery, we get that vivid picture to where while we're reading, I can imagine all of this happening, right? So that is fantasy, guys. I will go ahead and link a fantasy video, a figurative language video. I'm going to go ahead and, and um, include a theme video and a theme anchor chart again, just because I really, really want you guys to really focus on that. I don't want you to get the, com the, the misconception that theme is main idea because it is not. Remember, theme is the moral, is the moral or the lesson that you learned. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and link this video along with it. If you guys have any questions, you know, you can call me, text me, uh, message me through Castojo or send me an email. All right. See you later.